Stress actually isn't bad for you. Stress is the price we pay for a meaningful life. Believing stress is bad for you makes stress bad for you. So people that both feel stressed and think that stress is gonna take a toll on their health, that belief actually increases premature mortality by 43%. Welcome to the Most Days Show. The mission of Most Days is to measurably increase quality of life globally by helping people change their lives. This show is devoted to understanding how change happens. Today, we speak with Dr. Jenny Tates about stress resets. Dr. Tates is board certified in cognitive behavioral therapy by the American Board of Professional Psychology and a diplomat in the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. She's also one of the first psychologists to merit Linehan board certification in dialectical behavioral therapy. Dr. Jenny has just written and released a book called Stress Resets, which is 75 short, easy to do exercises that help us reduce in the moment stress. And so it's a really practical and accessible guide. And she does a great job in this episode of helping us understand what stress is, what's the difference between stress and anxiety, and then giving us some of these stress resets. She's a wonderful guest. Hope you enjoy. Dr. Jenny Tates, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to talk to you, Brent. So congrats on the new book. It's been out for what, a, a week? A week. Very excited. So the book is called Stress Resets, and it is a whole bunch of ways that we can reset our stress. So I'm excited. As somebody who is very stressed out most of the time, I'm excited to pull all of that as much of that knowledge out of you as we can. But before we do that, give us a little sense. How do you describe yourself personally, professionally? Give us the potted bio. Sure. I'm a clinical psychologist. I live in Los Angeles. I am a mom to three little kids. I love personally practicing all the things I prescribe to my clients. So I'm confident that they work. And yeah, I, I feel really lucky to do a mix of working with clients writing to reach an audience that might not be able to afford therapy or more people than I can meet one-on-one -on -one with. That I also teach uh, psychiatrists a little bit about how to do therapy at UCLA. So before we get into the resets themselves, I'd love to talk about the stress piece. And so maybe we can just start with what is stress and how do we think about, how do we differentiate stress from anxiety? Sure. So stress is when there's a mismatch between our resources our ability to cope and the demands that we're facing. So if there's this gap between what we're facing and our bandwidth, that's kind of how we describe stress. And I love the way um, someone that I was speaking to put it is it feels like you're you're on a treadmill that's going a little faster than you can keep up with comfortably that, and you also can't get off. And stress is different from anxiety because anxiety has a lot to do with worry and physical symptoms like tension in your body. But one of the reasons I love talking about stress is if we can address stress in time, we can prevent it from becoming a longstanding problem with anxiety and a lot of the tools that help anxiety help stress and vice versa. And would you put it on a continuum that stress is basically moderate anxiety or you'd put them on different axes? A little bit of a different axis because stress is often something that comes from an external trigger and anxiety might be something that's maybe more internal, our worrying, our judging, our predicting the worst. So stress is, there's just not enough hours in the day. I don't have enough bandwidth. I've got so many things to do, not enough time to do them. And that creates some negative impact on me physiologically. Um, whereas anxiety is, is something different. It's the talk track in my head. It's, it's, it's more internal. Is that what you're saying? And a lot of anxiety is anticipatory. It's things that might not even be happening. It's our mind is playing terrible tricks on us and we're behaving in ways that keep, it, keep us stuck. And then are, is there a set of diagnostic criteria for stress in the same way that there is anxiety? Where does it sit in terms of the formality of how we diagnose it and treat it? There is a wonderful measure called the perceived stress scale, which is one of the most common ways people measure stress. And I just even love the title of the measure, perceived stress, because again, a lot of stress is our perception. It's not necessarily how much we're facing, but also how much we believe we can manage what we're facing. And so I really try to help people both change their mindset so they can improve their perceived ability to cope and also find ways to cope that don't do a lot of damage that undermine our ability to cope. And so actually, interestingly enough, this perceived stress scale, if people are looking for it, I put it on my website because I 
really feel like if someone's spending money buying a book, I want it to actually help. And so I really invite you to take the perceived stress scale uh, and see if leaning on some of the tools I'm prescribing actually lead to a measurable reduction in stress. And it's obviously a little hard because you could do the stress scale and then have you know, a cat that gets really sick and a change in your job that makes it much more taxing. But hopefully the more you learn coping skills, the more your perceived stress goes down. And that's a that's a self-reported questionnaire like the GAD7 or the PHQ9. It's 10 questions, multiple choice, gives you a score. Exactly. And it's it's one of the most validated and ones that is used most widely in healthcare settings. Still lingering on stress and maybe the origins, what are, well, maybe I'll start with the further upstream question, which is what percentage of stress that you're seeing and the people who you work with is perceived? Like basically you don't have to change the underlying situation. Um, you just have to change the way that you perceive the situation to reduce the stress. And then what percentage of it is much more tactical in nature. Hey, you just have too much going on. You're saying yes too much. There are too many commitments. The way that we reduce stress here is we reduce the number of commitments or we change something you know, externally as opposed to the perception piece. How do you think about the difference between those two and how common or not each of them are as origins? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I think it's really both. There's a lot of stress that is we play a part in co-creating and there's a lot of stress that happens to us, but I think the same things matter. Like one of my biggest goals is like, life is really hard. Like life is really hard. A lot of stress is not your fault. A lot of people are working jobs that are not fulfilling, really demanding. A lot of people are struggling with not getting the social support they need, with feeling like there's too much on their plate. That being said, stress is also our behavior. And so do we lose ourselves in overthinking? Do we engage in behaviors that don't serve us, that stress us out, that were are impulsive and they're instant fixes, but they, we pay, pay a price for and that compromise our our ability to inch towards our long term goals. And so, I think a lot of us are facing a lot, but also you know some things are wild. Like many people are on average are spending like seventeen hours on social media, and so if you feel too overwhelmed, that might be one quick way to get a couple of days back. So it's a little bit of both. We're, we're creating, you know, sometimes we're creating the situation, but we also just live in an environment. We just often live in high stress environments and there's not a lot that we can do in some cases to change that. But the way in which we, the way in which we perceive it does matter in terms of, you know, how it, how it feels to us. And then how do you think about the difference between stress and worry? Then they really can relate to one another, but stress might be something that, again, is very legitimate, like something that you're facing that you need to triage and worry might be super unproductive. So stress can like worry. There can be a productive component, like I feel stressed and need to get things done. And it can also be like circular and you're stressing yourself out for no good reason. But the, the two certainly go hand in hand. There could be the sense of when everything feels too much, your mind starts to replay all your to-dos and tasks at times you can't do them and then they feed off each other that you have a lot going on and then the moments that you would like to kind of relax and unwind instead of using those moments your mind is holding you hostage and so that this is another huge thing that I try to focus on one of the biggest causes of stress is our minds right so like you know there's a great story that my friend and mindfulness teacher Sharon Salzberg tells of a man who was trekking in Nepal and he developed a blister. And before he stepped down, he anticipated the pain of the blister. He stepped down experiencing the ache and then replayed it between the steps. And so that is really threefold to pain or stress. And so too, a lot of our stress is how do we take something and prolong it? And this is a kind of a problem with us being human, but there are a lot of surprising quick ways to to not be a machine that feel like you're in a machine that manufactures stress. Yeah, my mom, she's a therapist and she used to always say something to the effect of, you don't need to worry about things because you might unnecessarily suffer it twice. Like if it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. And if it's not going to happen, you're suffering on it unnecessarily once in, a, in advance of it not happening. Or if it does happen, you've unnecessarily suffered it twice. I mean, I think that's easier said than done, but it is the mind just piling on <laughs> in a way um, that, that is not at all helpful. Well, it's easier said than done, but it's also like remarkably easy to, to stop. Like there are a lot of surprising solutions. Like for example, if people are asked to talk in detail about the most upsetting thing that happened to them, and they're hooked up to physiological measures where their stress response is recorded, 
if people have the chance to like eavesdrop on researchers that are standing outside chatting after this experience, they quickly change the channel. Um, you know, if you get a call right in the middle of a worry fest, you might quickly be able to be enter the conversation and forget what you were thinking about before. And so this is easier said than done at times, but with the right strategies, there are a lot of ways to reclaim where your mind goes. One more thing before we do, before we get into the strategies, which is what's happening physiologically in the body when we're experiencing stress? What is the impact of stress on I don't know, the like no, like biomarker and the length of our life or I don't know, you know, our, you know, the odds that we get some disease or something like how toxic is living in, how do we think about the toxicity of stress? Such an important thing to think about. Um, believing stress is bad for you makes stress bad for you. So people that both feel stressed and think that stress is going to take a toll on their health, um, that belief actually increases premature mortality by 43%. And so this is in a study of like 28,000 people. So stress actually isn't bad for you. Stress is the price we pay for a meaningful life. It's really important to be able to put stress down so you're not carrying it with you constantly because that's going to be hard. But it's also really important not to create a negative self-fulfilling prophecy of not only having stress, but worry about having stress, which is stressful, which actually can cause, can lead to early death. And, and why do you say, I think I agree with you, but I think it's worth um, going a little deeper on that stress is the price we pay for living a meaningful life. Why is that the case? If we think about it, any of the things that deeply matter to us are probably also a little bit stressful. Like when you said that you have a baby at home, I'm like, oh my gosh, I miss holding a baby. And that, that was also such a stressful uh, time. And, you know, I, I was saying to a friend of mine, I just, uh, as part of my work at UCLA, I had to go get a TB test. And the place to get the TB test is like also this place that all the med school students are studying. And just looking at all these students, like really stressed out with their textbooks. And, but they're also like on board to start a life that's going to change and save lives. And so they're like living their lives, but it's also like contagiously stressful to just watch them doing that. And so anything that matters and just like being part of this world means that you are if you're attuned to reality, you're probably going to experience a little bit of stress, but a life where you're just sitting like on a lounge chair, uh, drinking is probably not very full of opportunities to feel a sense of purpose or accomplishment. And so there, I don't want people to overdo it and take on more stress than they can um, manage or, you know, wear themselves out. But I, I do want people to realize that anything that's meaningful. I mean, look, anyone that is living their best life probably is incurring some amount of stress along the way. And when we're living by our values, we need to kind of be tested. You know, your kid having a wild temper tantrum is really your test of, are you a patient loving dad? And if they're perfect and always pleasant, it's you're kind of not really getting a good pop quiz there. Yeah. And it's, it, it resonates so much. I mean, from a, from, as a parent, and I don't, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of ways you can skin the cat. So it, being a parent, not being a parent, I think is totally, totally fine. And so I don't want to do the like parenting is the greatest or whatever thing. But I've realized, especially as I've had now, I had a seven-year-old. And then as we've said, I've got, I've got a couple that are younger that I've really increased my downside risk really dramatically. So I realized pre-kids, as soon as I had my first kid, I'm like, oh, the worst thing that could ever happen to me just got a lot worse. You know, before I had kids, the worst thing that ever could ever happen to me outside of just death would be cancer or a paralysis or some, you know, some really dramatic change basically in my health. And as soon as I had a kid, I realized I'm like, oh, I take those things a hundred out of a hundred days over something bad happening to the kid. Like those things don't look so bad at, at all. I take, I, there's no question I would take those things if given the choice of something having my kid or, or one of those things happening to me. And then as I've had two more, I've realized, oh, I'm multiplying my vulnerability and my risk. I now have three of these amazing little creatures out in the world, and I've got three times the, the, the amount of risk in terms of something happening to them. And so that's a really intense and deep and, you know, it's just a lot of vulnerability, but the relationship is really beautiful and I really love them and I really love being a father and I wouldn't have it any other way. So I don't know. It resonates for me in, in that way as I've had the third kid. I'm like, oh my gosh, now I've got three of them out in the world or something could happen to. Yeah. And I love what you're saying that this doesn't only apply to parenting, but it applies across the board. I'm sure if you had Taylor Swift joining you in conversation next week, that would be a little stressful, but incredibly 
joyful and meaningful. And I'm sure if you decided that you wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, that would be a really important thing in your life and something really memorable and meaningful, but also really taxing. Yeah, it reminds me, I'm a skydiver and I, I had a fear of heights. And skydiving is this really amazing experience because of, it's like this, just the loop of the psychological experience in such a short amount of time. So, and, and what I love is watching other people go through it for the first time. So you're watching people, you know, they're on the ground and they're really quiet in many cases. And like, they're pretty sure they're going to die. You know, you can tell in their head, they're like, what am I doing? I'm about to die. And then you ride with them on the plane and you kind of observe them on the plane. And once you've done it, I'm, I'm kind of a moderate skydiver. I've skydived a couple hundred times. You're not as nervous and you're watching and they're quiet, like they're getting closer. And then the door opens up and there's this moment of resignation. And then they're just thrilled on the ground. They're so excited when you see them back on the ground. It was the greatest thing ever. And just watching that whole loop. And it's a, you know, you got to incur the stress to get the fun of the free fall and to have the joy on joy on the ground. And what you're speaking to is such a powerful takeaway period, because interestingly enough, like one of the things I do with my clients, that's a little counterintuitive. And this is not like something I randomly thought of, but it's part of a, a really research backed program called the Unified Protocol, which is a lot of us really believe that if we start to feel an emotion, it's going to last for hours, get worse, ruin our days, weeks, nights of sleep. But really emotions come in waves. And so one of the things that I do that people are surprised to do is we watch video clips. Like I can make you cry in two minutes. I can make you angry in two minutes. I can make you laugh in two minutes. And it's really remarkable how when we stay present, emotions really rise and fall. And some of my clients that are big on TikTok tell me that, you know, you could do this in seconds, not minutes. But there is something really powerful and liberating about realizing that emotions are quickly changing and stress is quickly changing and we don't need to like get in there and make it go away. It will rise and fall if we stay anchored in the present and effective. Yeah. It took me so long to realize that. I mean, I've, I've, we, I've got just a lot of experience and been around a lot of addiction and so much I think of addiction is trying to numb that temporary feeling. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I don't like where I'm at. Okay. I'm going to try to do something to numb it and just ride it out. You know, it's like, it's all going to change again, easier said than done. I don't want to minimize. And as somebody who, you know, for me, it's kind of hard to get through the 5.30 to 7.30 period without a, without a beer. My life is so much better uh, when I do, but it is that like, oh, I got to, I got to take care of this. And it's like, no, you don't. It's going to be fine. And just to come back to what you're saying, which is like so brilliant. If you take care of the stress with a, with a substance, you are creating like stress on top of stress and so that's like my whole thing if we could stop the thinking and stop the acting in ways that don't help because like a couple of drinks could compromise sleep and then like you're paying a price for that tomorrow and today and that steals you of the chance to really feel like a sense of mastery or like i got this and i can rely on myself and so a huge thing and and super interesting like there's literally a program where they teach people urge surfing like how to just see your urges without judging them like ride them like waves and you get people that smoke cigarettes and teach them 11 minutes of urge surfing training they can literally have like a cigarette in their mouth and not feel super compelled to smoke it and they by just accepting like an urge is just an urge it doesn't mean i need to get in there it's going to go up it's going to go down i don't need to like i'm not going to lose my mind if i don't give into this it just goes away yeah, and it, and it will go away. It doesn't, it doesn't always seem that. And so much of this is subconscious. It's like, oh, I don't like this feeling. Okay, go for the beer. But if you're consciously remembering, wait, this is just an urge. The urge will go away. This is not gonna. This is not gonna last forever. So, so transitioning into the into the resets, because um, I really love the premise of the book, which is, hey, you know, you don't have. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do quickly in the moment to help alleviate some of the suffering from the stress. Do we break these into categories of things that we do in our head? I would put, I don't know, a meditating or a breathing exercise in that category. And then into a sec as one category. And then a second category of I'm, I'm doing a cold plunge or a sauna, or I'm, I'm getting some direct sunlight, you know, where do you want to start? And what's the most important piece to think about, you know, or, or maybe I'm thinking about the categories wrong, but I definitely think about the like sit down and do something to change my thoughts as one category. And then a second category is do something like, a, you know, I don't know, a cold plunge is something that's more external. Sure. So I divide the book into the first part of the book just really goes through your stress mindset and the role 
of rumination and really teaching tools on like managing emotions. And then the stress resets goes through ways to reset your mind. If your your mind is really messing with you, you're thinking the worst, you are judging, making something that's hard, like exponentially harder. So I teach mind resets, body resets, and behavior resets. So you can kind of choose your own adventure based on what you need in the moment. If you need to, if you feel stress a ton in your body, you know, it's interesting, there's different roads can change things. So like relaxing your mind can also change your body, but and changing your behavior can also change your body. So there's, there's something to try because different things work for different people. And sometimes these need to be stacked and, and kind of you need to create like a little orchestra of different things. Um, so you can play the right instrument at the right time. And then there's also buffers, which is things to do. So you're not just swinging from crisis to crisis, but things to do for your mind, body, and behavior as a way to boost your resilience. So you have a little bit more bandwidth and you're not just kind of like pumping on um, the crisis kit at all times, but there's things that create a life that feels more rich and fulfilling and full of possibility rather than going from like urgent care to urgent care, you're doing some preventative medicine. Is it prerequisite to discuss the mindset piece prior to the practical resets. I mean, and I, I come to this from a place of, you know, most days the name of the company, it's actually been a very important mindset for me. I spent a long time without a most days mindset, a mindset of self-compassion, of forgiveness, of I'm trying to eat well most days. I'm trying to exercise most days, but on the days when I don't, it's okay tomorrow's a new day. I don't need to go to this really dramatic place. That mindset has been just incredibly impactful for me as somebody who really struggles to live my life in a healthy way and has, I think I've, I've gotten a lot better, but I don't, that's not organic to me. And so what do we need to know about the mindset piece before we before we hit the practical exercises, or should we just jump into the practical exercises? It really depends on what you need. If you have like two minutes, then jump into a reset. And all of the resets will also affect your mindset because a lot of the, the whole point of all of the tools is to increase your psychological flexibility to be more flexible. And so ideally, if you have uh, the, the concept of a book on stress is so ironic. It's like you don't have time to read when you're stressed. And so this is really more of like a cookbook, like you can do something in the moment that's going to make things better. If you have the bandwidth to do some reading, then again, like it should only take a little bit of time to read the chapter on um, your stress mindset or turning your knots into bows. But also if you don't have time, if you're just like, I need help right now, I'm going into meeting and I'm flailing, there is something for you and they'll get at the same thing, which is not thinking it's such all or nothing terms to be a little bit less judgmental, present in the moment, effective in the moment, willing. Okay. So, and, and the, the origin of most of this work, I hear, I hear some acceptance and commitment therapy. I hear some dialectical uh, behavioral th uh, therapy. I hear some cognitive behavioral therapy. Is, is it a little bit of each? I, you know, I, I know you've, you spend a lot of time thinking about DBT, the origin of this work, where do we primarily find it coming from? Yeah, you're hitting all of the the, the the things that I'm leaning on. I I specialize, I'm board certified in CBT and also DBT. And these are tools that patients inevitably say to me, like, why didn't I learn this years ago? And like, and people also tell me about how much they need this and how they can't afford therapy. And so I teach the tools that I found the most impactful in my life and in the lives of my clients. And these aren't like learning different languages. These are all really rooted in overlapping goals of building a life worth living, living by your values, not letting your thoughts and emotions drive your life, but you deciding what matters to you and being able to manage your emotions in ways that serve you and be effective in relationships and effective when it comes to your physical sensations. And part of DBT is actually, there are parts of DBT that's like, you do, you know, the CBT protocol for panic if you're a DBT client that or a CBT protocol for insomnia if you're a DBT client that's dealing with panic and insomnia. It, 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 so it's not um, like an affair. This is all part of the um, kind of the same family and have different uh, different things resonate with different people and different things are needed at different times. So um, if you struggle with panic, there's something in there from CBT. If you want to really work on your values, there's some really nice values exercises and act. And then so this is probably the most common question you'll get about the book i mean you can tell me but what is the what's the number one stress reset this is so hard to say because again it's like choosing your favorite child i mean different things work for different people at different times and when i'm going through something stressful i'm really like doing a whole bunch of things 
I find a couple of things really powerful is like inroads. One of them is anchoring, like just feeling your feet on the floor. That creates kind of a sense of like, I'm not spinning, I'm here. The earth is supporting me, doing a quick three-point check. What am I thinking, feeling, feel like doing right now? Come back to the demands of this moment because a lot of awareness can create a lot of choice. And so knowing what you're thinking, feeling, and doing is like a powerful inroad to start to create change in those areas and create a trifecta of possibility of more flexibility in your thoughts, more acceptance or change with your body, and then more intention with your behavior so you're not just reacting in ways that will hurt you. And so just a silly quick example is, you know, one morning, um, I'm sorry again for all the parent examples, but one morning um, my husband was pouring a bottle of milk and he spilled like literally a gallon of milk on the floor and starts thinking like, I can't, I don't have time for this which anyone would think of that situation if you're tired and rushing and he like is moving quickly, which is part of the behavior of stress. And he cut his hand on the cake plate of the bottom of our refrigerator. And then we didn't have any bandages and he ran to the drugstore and you can't make this stuff up, but he literally gets into like a fender bender replaying his horrible, terrible bad day. And so if he had just literally did like an anchoring exercise for a couple minutes before, like, what am I thinking? What am I doing? Uh, what, what am I feeling in my body? What do I feel like doing right now? Like he could have slowed down dramatically along the way. And again, that's just one thing. There's a lot of different things and we need to kind of do a lot of these in tandem. Um, but taking a step back and seeing what's happening for you is a powerful way to start to change. Yeah, it remi- I'm coming back to skydiving again, but I, I don't think I've ever talked about skydiving on the show, but it, but I'm surprised it's coming up actually as much as, as it is. But one of the things that your story just reminded me of is in skydiving, there's this saying that slow is fast. Like if you think you're moving slowly, you know, if, you're, if you're skydiving with a group of other people and you're, you can do these little formations and stuff, you kind of can't go too slowly basically because in an environment where you're free falling at 125 miles an hour, you're really stupid, actually. Like your intelligence and your reaction, you're just, you're panicky, even if you're used to it. And when you're panicky, you like my intelligence is like 10% of what it is if I'm just sitting on the ground. And it's such a, it's, it it just reminds me of what you're saying is like, Hey, okay. You're stressed out and things are moving quickly. You know, I, I don't know if you would, you would say, oh, your intelligence is actually declining, but you're not thinking as clearly. Yeah, you're in this emotion mind and you're just, yeah, you're not, I mean, when you're skydiving, it's like, oh, I am, I'm like a four-year-old. I mean, I am, I'm really a very simple version of, of myself. And so that's just kind of being more on autopilot is what's happening to your husband in that moment and just kind of moving quicker than his brain is going. Or what is that emotion mind? Yeah, we're we're just acting on our emotion. Uh, an emotion is a very specific thing of like thinking in ways that don't serve us when we're feeling intense emotions. And so if there's turbulence on a plane, you could easily think like I'm going down rather than be really thoughtful and say, hmm, it seems like a lot of pilots live long, healthy lives and they fly a lot longer than I do and turbulence is okay. But yeah, there's something that happens when emotions spike where we're not thinking reasonably, but we're thinking in ways that are fueled by emotions and even just noticing a labeling emotion mind gives us some working distance. So a lot of this is about slowing down because we don't want to quickly get into thinking the worst and being in a thought spiral and behavior like going 100 miles an hour, you're going to do a lot of damage. But if you can slow down, you have a lot more room. And I, I just gave the example of my husband, but there's like a million that I've done and a million that other people have done. You don't want to send that email when you're just get that news and you don't want to send that text when you're feeling intense emotions and you don't want to be thinking life is unfair when things are already hard. And so really taking inventory and being able to, to even have a sense of humor of, you know, I one of the skills I teach in my book is something that I got from a client. But you know, every Saturday night he would have the thought when he didn't have plans, I'm such a loser. Like it's hard enough not to have plans on Saturday night. You don't need a voice in your head telling you you're the biggest loser in a persuasive way. So he, you know, learning to, again, there's so many different strategies, but like singing that thought, like I'm the biggest loser to the tune of do you believe in magic is a quick way to remember you're in emotion mind. Um, You don't need to like take spam is very important. You know, a very important person giving you like useful feedback in your life. Yeah, it took, I didn't hear this strategy. It was the last couple of years that I heard about the sing 
your worries or whatever's happening or say them in a silly voice. So can you, can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. And so one of the biggest problems we have is as intelligent human beings, we take our thoughts very seriously. Like if I asked you to write an essay on what you have in common with a lemon, you might be able to like generate some interesting information about you both have skin, you could taste a lemon. I mean, you could really get in, into, into a whole thing with that. And so we take our thoughts like very seriously. And you know, even just thinking about something like a cockroach while you're in a donut store could like create a very physical sensation from going from like your mouth watering to feeling disgusted. And so we're really tormented by the fact that our thoughts have such a profound impact on us. But our thoughts oftentimes are just like nonsensical. Like there's nothing that you have in common with a lemon and that's not worth exploring. And just because I thought cockroach in a donut store doesn't mean that it's there or contaminated the donut. And so we all need to learn how to, when thoughts come up that are not helpful to us, rather than trying to convince ourselves that they're not rational or ask other people for reassurance, we can change our relationship with them. So we're like taking them less seriously. We're playing with them. They're just a combination of sounds um, they don't necessarily have meaning. And so there's something about singing your thought that changes it from being in, con it, it's controlling you. Like, I really feel like the biggest loser to like, oh, that's what my mind does on Saturday night. Like that, it's really kind of hard to be human because like my mind is, can, can be a bully at times. Like there's something about, and again, this is really quick, but texting everyone like life sucks and looking at social media, like believing that everyone has it better can really bury you, but you can kind of get a good chuckle and reclaim your night and do something that you would do if you didn't believe that to be true, which would actually be the ultimate thing. So the, the reason we do this is because our thoughts can affect our behaviors and our behaviors can create the scope of our lives and we don't want our minds telling us things that don't help. And so just a very silly example is I was at a conference a long time ago, early in my career, and a senior person that had written like textbooks that I had read um, came up to me and he was like, oh, hey, are you going to give a presentation at this year's conference? I said, oh, no, I'm not a very good public speaker. And he said something that was so mind-blowing that I continue to think about it. Did you think your mind for that thought? Which is like, so, like, did you think your mind for that thought? Like, wow, like my mind gave me that thought. It's not like, I don't need to like let that thought like prevent me from signing up to give talks at conferences. I don't need to like let that thought be like an excuse I give to other people. I can thank my mind for that thought. Yeah, I love that. I mean, this, um, you know, this, this thoughts and emotions, uh, they don't always make sense. We don't always need to pay attention to them or take them too seriously. And the very practical advice of, okay, you're saying to yourself that you're a loser because you don't have plans on Saturday. All right, sing that, you know, or say it in a really goofy voice or say it over and over again until it just sounds really weird. You know, if you just say a word over and over again, you start to lose the meaning of the, of the sound of the word. And then I really love the, um, you know, the example with your husband where in those chaotic moments, like stop, pause, you know, think about this, ground yourself, observe what's happening, think about the situation. It's a little bit of like slow down to speed up. You know, like in CPR training, they'll tell you, okay, the first thing you do is just pause and like assess the situation before you start, you know, just diving in and, and trying to help somebody. Oh, if people are listening and being like, I can't stop, I'm going hundred miles an hour, there's something for you. You know, there's other options, like for example, dipping your face in a bowl full of ice water, holding your breath for 30 seconds, submerging your face in ice water. That will do the same thing as anchoring different way, different different practice, same outcome of like, you will slow down, you will be able to think a little bit more clearly. And so if you're someone that's thinking like, that won't work for me, there's there's a lot of other things you can try. So the face in ice water, is that a, you're in such an uncomfortable position that you can't think of anything else? Or is there some other physiological reaction to that that's helpful? Or maybe it's both. So this is a skill taught in the DBT crisis survival um, distress tolerance unit. And basically, if you hold your breath and submerge your face in cold water, that activates your vagus nerve that slows down your heart rate. And this is part of the mammalian dive response. And so it like physiologically will just redirect blood flow from non-essential to essential organs. And then just practically when you're in kind of a drastic kind of temperature change, 
it's hard to imagine that you're going to be pl- thinking the same thing. You're just very grounded by the sensation of of cold. But this has to do with uh, any superpower that we all have with this dive response. And how much of the theme of the stress resets would map to cold or hot or how many of them? I mean, for for me, I'm lucky enough. I've got a sauna in my home. It was the one thing I was like, I don't, we don't need like a big house or anything. I just want to have a, a sauna because the number one way for me to reduce my stress, go for a run, then go directly into the sauna for 15 or 20 minutes and really just sweat it out and, and just be in very uncomfortably hot and then drop into a cold plunge, which is just a cold bath. I just fill up the bathtub with cold water. Cold water. As somebody who runs pretty anxious and who's, who's pretty stressed, that's, that's like the number one thing for me. Now that takes, I don't know, an hour and a half or something. But how much of this is supported by, okay, make yourself really hot, make yourself really cold, exercise? The only temperature thing is the cold. Um, but I want people to lean on what works for them in terms of exercise. I'm all about doing this in a few minutes. So the the cold in your ice face thing is 30 seconds. You don't need a fancy cold plunge. This is just salad bowl ice water. In terms of exercise, like remarkably in just a couple minutes, you could do burpees, squat jumps, jumping jacks. And if you're feeling really anxious, it's a little nicer to attribute your heart racing to like, I just did a bunch of burpees then like I can't control, I I can't deal with my life and I'm out of control and I'm not, I'm going to humiliate myself in that meeting. And so there's something about, there's this uh, acronym in DBT called TIP, which is temperature, which is the ice face intense exercise, which is like 90 seconds. It doesn't have to 90 seconds, couple of minutes. It's not going to like for an hour intense run. And then P is um, paced breathing, which is slow breathing. Um, breathing in for five seconds, out for five seconds, which is really remarkable and has a, creates a kind of a calm alertness. And then the final P, this is a tip with two Ps, um, is progressive muscle relaxation. So tensing and releasing from your head to your toes, like tensing your face, releasing, tensing your shoulders, and you could go through this. And so all these things like are meant, you don't need to like have tons of fancy things at your disposal. You don't need tons of time. You don't need to be a marathon runner. You could you can do these things in just a matter of minutes. And on on breathing, so that's the you just did a you just you just recommended a five five, which would be a, a five second inhale and a five second exhale. Do you think about that differently than a, a breathing exercise that has a hold? You know, so there's the classic. I think would be the four seven eight, full lungs you know, so full, full inhale for four seconds and fill up your lungs, seven second hold, and then eight second exhale and do that. Um, how do you think about the difference between those two things if I, or, or any other kind of breathing exercise? Different things work for different people. And I know what you're describing is like a favorite of Navy SEALs. What I'm describing, some psychiatrists um, who I really like, um, who wrote a book called The Healing Power of the Breath, moved away from prescribing medications and are now working with disaster survivors, prescribing the coherent uh, breath practice that I described. I personally don't love holding my breath. I kind of like the slow breathing, but different things work for different people. And I also introduced box breathing in the book. And um, so I want people to have a whole host of, you know, what, what try different things, what what seems to work with you and your needs. And what is it that you don't like about the hold? You just personally, you just don't prefer it or there's something more than that? Oh, no, no. Just I personally kind of like the the uh, continuous like slow breathing and slow breathing out. And I think part of the reason that I prefer that is because I like the idea of trying to slow my breathing down throughout the day. And that's a little easier for me to do naturally versus intentionally holding my breath. And then pro- progressive muscle relaxation would be the either maybe head to toe or toe to head, tense up the muscle and then let it go, move on to the next section and go all the way top to bottom or bottom to top. Exactly. And this is kind of like getting a massage, but you're the masseuse. And so you need to, you can't kind of let your mind go wherever it wants to go. It's really mindful to be super uh, focused on like, am I tensing my forehead? Am I releasing with each inhale and exhale? I'm continuously releasing. I mean, a lot of times we need to do this to just be more aware that our shoulders are touching our ears and tightening places in our body that we might not realize we're, we're clenching. And what about something like smiling? Is that, you know, does the science support that? Is that a wives tale, you know, a simply smiling? What, what do we think about that? 
So it depends on the situation. Again, a lot of these are context specific. So if our faces are really powerful communicators, so if I'm mad at you, I don't want to be smiling at you because that is not giving you like the information that you need at that time. But if you are annoyed and you would like to create more of a landscape of acceptance or quiet your mind, there's something about half smiling, which is not like a fake smile, but a facial expression of serenity. It's really more of like an eighth of a smile. Um, there is research that like there is a facial feedback loop and relaxing your face can allow for more positive emotions. And I just personally find it's almost like you can't tense and relax at the same time if you're relaxing your face you're probably going to be a little bit more relaxed with your mind. And so if I'm standing in a long line and in a hurry, it's hard for me to tell myself, like, stop thinking, like, relax. But if I intentionally try to half smile, maybe that allows me to notice there's like a cute dog and there's like something I forgot that I want to go grab. Maybe that also allows me to smile at someone else and can kind of create a positive virtuous cycle. What about gratitude and gratitude practices? Yeah, there's a lot of research that gratitude can be helpful and there are different ways to practice this. And again, this is kind of like a win-win situation. If you feel grateful to someone else and express your gratitude to them, that could make their day and make them more grateful to other people. And I know this is hard to do, but this, one of the problems with stress is it really narrows our attention. And so specifically like looking out like bigger than what's immediately in front of us can create more ease and appreciation. And I I think it feels annoying for people to say, like, focus on three good things when you're having a hard time. But if you really focus on, like, how do I want to show up in my life? Do I want to try to look for things that are small that, like, I'm grateful for that that a little nicer than it being shoved shoved down your throat. And and I also just want to say that there's it's it's a little tricky because a big part of this is like self validation. So I don't want anyone to that's having a really hard time to think they need to be grateful all the time. I think there's like a way to normalize like this job is really really hard. I don't enjoy it. Like that's it's really hard to work somewhere you don't enjoy. Pause. And I'm also grateful that like it allows me to pay for food. You know, I think there's like this nice dance between not minimizing things that are hard, but also trying to be flexible and in your perspective. So it's not so all or nothing. Yeah. The, the practice of in that, in that process, comparing the like, oh, but so-and-so or, or this group of people or this person has it worse. I hate that because it really invalidate if at least for me personally, I feel it's totally invalidated about the way I'm feeling like, yes, I know there's, you know, there's only one person in the world who has it the worst. And so the like stack rank game doesn't really work. I'm experiencing something. I'm not enjoying it. It just sucks. You know, so I feel a little bit worse about it. I'm like, oh, man, I'm not supposed to feel bad about it because there are worse things that could be happening or there are people that have it worse. Um, I find that whole merry-go-round to be to be a little bit tricky. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And I, I think some people find that comparing yourself to a time you had it harder is better than comparing yourself to someone else. Like if I got through this particularly challenging time in my life, like I can certainly get through this rather than comparing yourself to someone else. And I, I think rather than gratitude being something you lean on in a really hard moment, because again, that seemed like if someone said to me in the time that I was having a hard time, like you should be grateful, like you should be thankful, like or you're not being focusing on the good, how lucky you have it, that would be really annoying. And so I think a better practice is having a gratitude as part of your routine um, as like a buffer to compensate for the negativity bias, our human tendency to focus on problems rather than be something that you like try to grasp in a, in a hard moment. How, how do you think about the the stoic versions of these? I mean, one thing that's that I a random thing that I do that's been surprisingly helpful is I remind myself, oh, I'm not having I don't have a sore throat today. That's really awesome. Because every time I get a sore throat, I'm like, you're so ungrateful. The person, you know, the Brent that never has a sore throat is never grateful for the fact he doesn't have a sore throat and sore throats are the worst. And so there's that version, which is, it's a little bit of what you're saying. You're comparing to some previous version or the version, I think it's a little trickier, but, but helpful, which is um, meditating on worst case scenarios, you know, meditating on what it would feel like if, you know, kind of thinking through something really bad happened 
And then coming back to a presence where that bad thing hasn't happened, I think can feel pretty good. It feels like maybe a little bit more of an advanced exercise, but how do you think about like the stoic version of, you know, these gratitude practices? I prescribe a whole bunch in the, in the book of different gratitude practices. I don't specifically uh, prescribe a stoic version just because that's not really my, my um, area of expertise. So I, I would love to learn more about that. And in terms of meditating on the worst, I don't love like living through worst case scenarios. Instead, I I prescribe something called coping ahead. It's if you know something is going to be challenging, how do you mentally prepare, like given realistically how this is going to unfold? What are the things I could do right to improve how it goes, how I cope with it if I know that I'm about to have a really difficult meeting instead of going through all the things that are probably going to go wrong in worst case scenarios, like, no, this is how, like, this person's going to ask me about these things. This is how I'm going to have this complicated conversation about this upsetting thing. And so I, I like doing something that's really practical and empowering rather than putting you through unnecessary pain. And then how do you think about, you know, I think a lot of people when they're dealing with stress, I know this can be true as a parent, they might tell themselves that a little bit of marijuana might help the glass of red wine might help the xanax might be helpful you know these things that i think we all know intellectually they're they're bad or we're not supposed to do them but i think just casually those are we turn to those things a lot in these kind of end of the day it's been a really stressful day i, I want to give myself the glass of wine or i want to eat the gummy or you know or or take the xanax how do you think about the role of those, if any, um, how do you talk to your, you know, the people you work with about, about those things? Yeah, there's a whole chapter where I get into this. Um, but yeah, cannabis is an interesting one because it's a plant and it's legal. And I live in Los Angeles and people, uh, I don't want everyone to hate me, but um, ca using cannabis uh, can, is the, cannabis is not an evidence-based treatment for anxiety or depression. I, with clients that have severe seizures, um, issues related to cancer or pain management, that's a different situation. But one of the things that I, I really want people to remember is like your body is your best pharmacy. You have an innate ability to reset. You don't need to lean on things outside of yourself. The problem with cannabis specifically is it creates loss of motivation. And I think a lot of people already struggle with loss of motivation. And there's other side effects that come with using cannabis that I get into in, in the book. But um, not great for coping and not great for feeling like I got this and I could cope within myself. And a glass of wine can compromise sleep quality. So if you're feeling like things are hard, you don't want to lose your good quality sleep and hangover and set you up for potentially drinking more than you intend to. And then that could affect your exercise plan for tomorrow or your sharpness or your impulse control tonight. And um, so yeah, I, I've never had a client that regretted reducing their alcohol intake. And then in terms of benzodiazepines, benzodiazepines, I, I get into this a lot more, but they create like a feeling of they slow, really slow you down. And a lot of times when we're stressed, we need to be sharp and alert. And benzodiazepines are habit forming. They're addictive. Long-term use is associated with cognitive decline. It can be hard for people who start taking them to discontinue because they work really well. And some of the most brutal withdrawals that I've seen, but also the most worthwhile are uh, people that get dependent on benzodiazepines. And so, yeah, I really want people to feel like it's so remarkable to feel like you can cope with what shows up in your life. You know, I really think like peace of mind is not life being easy, but knowing you can count on yourself regardless of what shows up in your life. And I don't want people to feel like they need to be grabbing things outside of themselves that have, that have downsides. And actually one of the impetuses for writing this book was a study um, that found that people who were about to go into surgery, people were either given a benzodiazepine, a medication like uh, clonopin or Xanax, or were able to listen to a song called Weightless, which is it was designed by sound therapists. And remarkably, the song worked almost as well as the benzodiazepine. And obviously, songs don't have side effects. And so I, yeah, I, I don't want a whole host of people that don't like me, but I also want to empower you to like stay um, sharp and not put yourself in danger of losing motivation and your ability to think clearly and sleep well. And I, I think there's a lot of ways to recalibrate from stress that don't involve substances that 
can take a toll on you. Yeah, I had a really heroin coming off of Benzo is one of the hardest things I ever did. It, you know, I, I ended up having to use this thing called the Ashton manual, which is this, you're probably familiar with this titration schedule. And because I had just stopped taking it thinking, okay, I'm, the anxiety's over, I'll stop taking this medication. And it was not, uh, it was not that simple. Um, well, so what's, uh, as we wrap, what's, what's next for you? You know, how, how are, what's the next, but this is your third book, right? So, so what's next for Dr. Jenny? Yeah, I just want to keep spreading evidence-based hope and trying to inspire people to live better lives and trying to get this message out there. And yeah, my biggest goal is like therapy costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time and everyone deserves these tools. So I just want to grateful to you and your podcast for being able to spread this. And I want to continue to amplify this message. And in a, I guess in about six months, there will be an accompanying card deck that goes along with this. I just want people in hard moments to have something they could quickly pick up to change change how they feel. And you can do that in a matter of minutes if you know exactly how. Yeah, excellent. The book is Stress Resets. It's been out for about a week. Congrats again. There are 75 or so resets in there. Um, so really handy. And I love the message of, look, we've got the power within. We don't, you know, you don't need the glass of red wine or the Xanax or whatever, you've got all of the tools um, inside. And, you know, I think we can, we can turn to teachers like you to, to understand those tools. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. The Most Day Show is recorded in Boulder, Colorado, music by Patrick Lee, produced by Patrick Adino, and hosted by yours truly, Brent France and founder and CEO of Most Days. 